Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. As I said, we're going to spend the entire Advent and Christmas season walking through Luke 2. This is the biggest section we'll have in any given service, the first four verses. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. That's the text. So over the years we have looked at Christmas and Advent from a variety of different perspectives again this week or this year, I thought we'd be good to just very deliberately walk through the Christmas gospel. We read these verses in worship on Christmas Eve and again on Christmas Day. Some of you, like me, read them around the Christmas tree with your family before you open the presents, forcing your children to wait just a little longer to open their presents, you know, while they hear what this event is really all about. And trust me, folks, Luke 2 can help you cut through all of the different aspects of the Christmas season that frustrate you and keep you from celebrating it as you should with peace and goodwill. You may remember Linus using a part of Luke 2 to help out Charlie Brown in just that problem. He was having a lot of trouble over the commercialization of Christmas and Linus helps him out here. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? True, sure, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. <laughs> so simple, isn't it? Those were the days. I don't know that you'll find that in any other Christmas special. I can guarantee you won't find it in Fred Claus, Shrek the Halls, Mary Madagascar, Ice Age a Mammoth Christmas special, Toy Story that time forgot. You won't find it in Santa Claus Conquers the Martians. Or any of the other more or less famous Christmas specials out there. Just out of curiosity, how many of you, like me, actually watched Santa Claus Conquers the Martians? <laughs> Just, okay. Why would you watch such a thing? Because they made it. Okay. You know, some of them are cute. Some of those specials may even hold a special place in your heart. It's okay. But in almost none of them will you actually hear the Christmas gospel and find out through it what Christmas is all about. And so again, I want to take a deeper walk through Luke 2, the Christmas gospel, starting with these first four verses where we find out that the Christmas gospel and the whole gospel of Jesus Christ is not just history. It is truly 
his story. It's so ironic, really, how emperors and world leaders think they are the ones moving and shaking when in reality they're being moved. God is in control. History is his story. It's not just a random series of events. But of course, as we've seen over the years, most of our rulers, they don't get that. They don't understand or they reject the fact that their authority really does come from God and therefore they are accountable to him for their actions and their decrees. Caesar Augustus, of course, was no different as he issued his decree. He didn't care about the expense. He didn't care about the inconvenience of all the literally millions of people who would have to travel back to their hometowns to register. He didn't care about a simple carpenter in Galilee. He didn't care about who was pregnant, who was young, who was old. He just issued a decree as though he really was the one in charge of the entire Roman world. But we know better. God lays it out very simply in Proverbs. By me kings reign and make laws that are just. By me princes govern and all nobles who rule on earth. Not by themselves, but by God. And folks, the more you dig into this account, the more you see that history is his story. These first few verses in Luke might be a section that you would be tempted to just pass through very quickly and get to the meatier stuff about shepherds and, and mangers and so on. But this little mention, folks, of Caesar Augustus and Quirinius actually do something incredibly important for the Christmas gospel according to St. Luke. They anchor it in history. They beg to be fact-checked, and they can. We know from other reliable history outside of the Bible, really all of the Roman emperors, it's quite interesting history. We can't get into all of it here. I was really surprised we talked about it in Bible class today. Uh, a lot of people were able to pull out of their memory quite a few of the Roman emperors. We may remember that the Roman Empire actually didn't start out as an empire. It started out as a... Anybody? A republic, right? And, and so they governed under senators, and senators shared the power and shared the decision-making. Not unlike what we have uh, today, we have a representative republic. Some of you thought we were in a democracy, but no, we are living in a republic. Um, probably ours might not even be as corrupt as theirs was in the latter days of the republic. Then came a guy by the name of anybody maybe know what changed the republic, what began to change the republic? What's that? Yes, a guy by the name of Gaius Julius Caesar. At that time, Caesar was just a family name. It didn't mean emperor at all. It, it meant uh, Harry. <laughs> Someone in his genealogy was Harry, and so that name was passed on as the family name. Okay, and, and they sort of made fun of Julius because he didn't have a lot up here, sort of like some of the rest of us uh, here today. Anyway, uh, later that title Caesar would become more of a, a royal title. But at the time, he was a very popular general, conquered a lot of Europe, and went on to conquer all of Britain. But he wasn't content with that, so he marched his army back to Rome and crossed the Rubicon with his army, and that signaled the fact that he was going to take over. And so there was civil war, lots of battles and intrigue, but eventually he was proclaimed to be dictator for life. That went for a while until he was murdered by his friends. And that's where we get the term et tu brute, because Brutus was one of the guys that with his friends went and stabbed uh, Caesar. And Caesar said, you too, Brutus? So then there was more civil war and battles, and, and that was with Mark Antony and Cleopatra, if you want to know some other names. And there was a triumphant of power for a while. And, and finally... Uh, Caesar's adopted son, adopted at his, uh, in his will at his death, was a guy by the name of Octavius. We call him sometimes Octavian. And he solidified his power and changed his name to 
Augustus. Yes, Caesar Augustus, the august one, the, the majestic one, the venerable one, and also took then the, the title of Imperator, from which we get the word emperor, making him the first Roman emperor. He ruled from 27 AD to 14, uh, sorry, 27 BC until his death, 14 AD. Later we had the emperors Tiberius and Caligula, Claudius and Nero, that guy who when Rome burned blamed it on the, on the Christians and began a serious uh, Christian persecution. What is the point of all of this? History lesson. Point is that Luke was well aware of the history in which he lived and recorded it very accurately. Of course, Caesar Augustus was the emperor when Jesus was born. He went on to talk about this guy Quirinius, and actually Luke has gotten a lot of flack over this because Quirinius didn't uh, assume the governorship of the Roman province of Syria until 6 AD. So people said, well, Luke got it wrong. And of course Luke didn't get it wrong. The, the fact is that the text doesn't say, the Greek doesn't say he was governor. It says that he was governing. And he was governing at that time of that first census. In fact, he was in charge of the census in Syria at the time. In fact, in the two books that Luke wrote, what we know as the Gospel according to St. Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, Luke refers to 20 other rulers nailing down those historic times and they can all be fact-checked and have been fact-checked and he is absolutely right. He goes on to list 32 countries, 54 cities, nine islands without making a single mistake. Folks, when Luke writes at the start of his gospel, I myself have very carefully investigated everything from the beginning, he's not just blowing smoke, he is really truthful, he investigated everything, and he gets it all right. We can trust this account. I guess, you know, on a side note, that's one of the most frustrating things for me about uh, the Mormon church in America. They have over six million followers. It's frustrating to me because that religion has none of that reliability. None of their facts check out. It's the Book of Mormon is supposedly the story of lost tribes of Israel who came to the United States 722 BC, supposedly on some highway that was built across the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, they supposedly built in the Americas cities and roads and bridges and monuments and they had armor and coins and pots and pans and so on and absolutely none of it checks out. There's not a single coin, there's not a single uh, stone that has ever been found that would make the Book of Mormon anything but a figment of Joseph Smith's very active imagination. And this was very sad for that group that has been sucked in by an unreliable account when in fact we have the exact opposite in the Bible. Every city, every river, every mountain, every ruler, every verse of the Bible checks out. And it is only reasonable to assume that the same historian who got everything else right in his accounts also got the Christmas gospel right. And he did. So we move on to Joseph. Since everybody had to go to his hometown to register, Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David, the lineage of David. And we could have dug really a lot deeper on this one verse and made a whole sermon out of this. The house and line of David, folks, was incredibly important to the Jews. They were very carefully recording really all of their family trees, but especially the family tree of anyone who is an ancestor of David because they longed for one of those ancestors to proclaim himself king again and overthrow the Roman uh, system. So for instance, the prophecy from 2 Samuel to King David God told him, when your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, part of that prophecy was fulfilled already in his son Solomon. 
But it was, the rest of it was just a huge messianic prophecy. They knew there was another one that God was referring to who would come again and establish the throne of David. So Matthew very carefully traces the lineage of Joseph all the way back to David and even all the way back to Abraham. Luke later records the lineage of Mary all the way to David and really then all the way back to Adam. Jesus was the son of David from both sides, from Mary and from his adopted father, uh, Joseph. His earthly father, too, was a son of David. And so again, he went up from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Bethlehem's built on a ridge about 2,500 feet above sea level, so it's higher than Nazareth. And the two towns are about 60 miles apart as the crow flies, as they had to travel on the roads of the time, probably more around 80 miles. So, you know, about the distance between Coopersville and Lansing. So you travel that, you can travel that in about an hour and 20 minutes. Um, they would take walking about four days if they were having a wagon, maybe three days travel. Of course, we know how Joseph and Mary got there, right? <clears throat> Joseph walked. Pregnant Mary was stuck on a donkey. We know that because they drew pictures of it. And they have Christmas specials where that's how we see it. So it must be true, right? Folks, Joseph was a carpenter. Now, I know they didn't have a lot of money, but you don't think a carpenter could figure out a wagon for his pregnant wife? They took wagons to Egypt way back before they were slaves in Egypt. And they took wagons out of Egypt during the Exodus. I see absolutely no reason why Joseph wouldn't have used a wagon to make his pregnant wife more comfortable on this journey. Now if we're going to look at the Christmas gospel deeply, let's look at it honestly. And let's see it not from the pictures on the Christmas cards or the scenes on the Chris Christmas specials, but from how it was actually recorded in God's Word and how it was directed by God. In fact, some of you are not going to like this. I showed this uh, already, well, of course, first service, and then I showed it in Bible class again. We're going to mess with your paradigms of the nativity. I've showed this once before in a sermon a few years ago. It's called Retuning the Nativity. Let's take a look. One December night, over 2,000 years ago, a shining star illuminated a gathering of kings, shepherds, angels, and animals round a baby in a stable. Twas the nativity, and it marked the end of a journey that began on a donkey's back. Whoa, hold up there, Jeeves. Yeah. I beg your pardon? Your nativity. That's not exactly how it happened. Here, look, let's start with that donkey. Neither of the gospel stories mentions Mary traveling by donkey. And given the 60 miles of rough terrain they traveled, it's more likely they used a wagon. <laughs> Minor details. But then the innkeeper informs them there's no room... Again, the Bible doesn't actually mention an innkeeper. And in the Greek, the word inn refers to an upper room in a house, not an actual motel. Oh, blast. Look, wherever it was, there was no room. So, Mary and Joseph were sent to the stable. Uh, no stable. <sighs> Not in the Bible either. Now you're catching on. And in those days, most animals were typically kept in a cave. A cave? Yuppers. So it could have been that instead of a stable, the Bible doesn't really say. And the Star of Bethlehem? Duh, that's biblical. Well, we're actually right for once. It's a Christmas miracle. Okay, so now came the shepherds and the three kings. No kings. Three kings is from the song. The Bible says magi, which means wise men. Three wise men? That works. Well, not so fast. While the Bible does mention three gifts, it doesn't specify the number of wise men that brought them. You mean there could have been more? Oh, yeah. A whole posse, even. With a crowd like that, it's a miracle the baby Jesus never cried. What, no crying he makes? That's just a lyric from Away in a Manger, not actual scripture. 
<laughs> well, of course he was crying. You just added a whole crowd of strange men. Eh, yes and no. There may have been many wise men, but they weren't there that night. You see? Okay, that's enough. Except for the Bloomin' Star of Bethlehem, you've just dismantled the most inspiring image of Christian tradition. So what's your point? Point? Well, I guess it's this. Even when all of the man-made traditions are stripped away, the eternal truths still remain. Whether they traveled by donkey or wagon, God brought them safely to the birthplace that was prophesied. Whether born in a stable or cave, God provided shelter in a strange new land. Whether there were three kings, three wise men, or many, God called the elect to bear witness and testimony to the birth of Emmanuel. So whether your manger looks like this, or like this, the one thing that remains unchanged is this. A baby boy, born of a virgin, this day in the city of David, a savior, which is Christ the Lord. Bless you, sir. I'll never look at the miracle of December 25th the same way again. December 25th? Oh, I almost forgot. Stop that. Music! December 25th, of course, was uh, a festival of Saturnalia, riotous midwinter festival that the Christian church decided we got to break people out of that. And so let's choose that to be the day of, of the uh, birth of our Savior. And slowly, very slowly, people did tend to break out of that wild, debaucherous celebration to at, at least some of us a more accurate celebration of the birth of Christ. What is my point in showing you something like that? I don't want to deliberately blow up your nativity sets, not at all. But I do want us, if we're going to look at the Christmas gospel, to have the fullest picture of it that we possibly can and understand that the Christmas gospel is his story, not just a random series of events, but that God was in every one of those, drawing wise men and shepherds and, you know, even playing with kings and their, decre their decrees to orchestrate it in the fullness of time to bring his Son and our Savior on the stage. When will kings and princes Governors and presidents learn that the only kingdom that will prevail in this world, ultimately, is the kingdom that is not of this world. The kingdom of Augustus Caesar crumbled and fell. All that's left are the ruins that people like to visit today. God's kingdom marches on. Our kingdoms are built with roads and bridges. His kingdom is built in the road to your heart. Symbol of our kingdoms is a crown of gold. The symbol of his kingdom is a crown of thorns. But he wore that crown and he shed his blood for you. He was and is the epitome of the true king who gave his life for his subjects that they might go free from slavery to sin and death. It's funny how an emperor, somebody who thinks he's in charge can do something that he thinks is great, but really it's just a small part in a plan of something much greater than he. Caesar Augustus listed this census, recorded in Luke 2, as one of the great achievements of his reign. Maybe it was, but in reality it was just God pushing the pieces, fulfilling another prophecy that the Savior would be born in Bethlehem, the town of David. Caesar issued a decree but the real king of the universe sent a baby who changed our future, redeemed our broken past, died that we might live, and lives that we might never die. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that in the changes and chances of this life, we know that you are in control. That when the time had fully come, you sent your Son, our Savior, into this world for us, to redeem us, 
and give us the full rights of sons and daughters in your kingdom. Lord, help us truly to embrace our Savior this Christmas. Help us get at the gospel of Christmas. Get at it even around the lights and the distractions, the gifts, the shopping, the crowds. And help us to celebrate it as you want us to celebrate it. The greatest gift that has ever or will ever come to us, your Son and our Savior. In his name, amen. May the peace of God, which passes our ability even to understand it, keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.